Amen. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to be here to worship the Lord our God. Give him praise as we do. They're going to tell me I don't have this on in a minute, right? Is that better? Yeah, crank it up wherever you need it and we'll get it done. So let us pray as we begin the service today and uh, open our hearts to the Lord, receiving from him what is needed in our lives as we worship together. Let us pray. Father, what a joy it is to come together on a Sunday morning like this and realize that we're truly blessed, that we have been redeemed by the precious blood of your Lamb. And that redemption work has washed away our sin and made us children of God. And so we thank you for that redemption. We thank you for the life that we have in Jesus. And we thank you for the hope that he brings to our hearts and our minds and our lives. And every step of the way, may you be at work in us. May you show us, reveal to us what we need to see as we walk and as we live. May we pay attention to what you're opening up for us. May we step into it as instruments in your hand. Bless us, Lord, as we sing. A number of songs today we haven't sung much, but we want to be able to get some words up and out and give you praise for all that you are and all that you do. Thank you for building your church, building it all around us and within us. We're thankful to be a part of that community that has come together by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the word of the Lord. Bless your people. Receive our praise. Have your way in us, and with us this week. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Stand with me and let us begin.
Can I hear the word of God read this morning? Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. We'll be reading from Second Chronicles, chapter twenty nine. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres, according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan the prophet. For the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. The Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offerings be offered on the altar. And when the burnt offerings began, the song to the Lord began also. And the trumpets, accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped. And the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. All this continued until the burnt offering was finished. When the offering was finished, the king and all who were present with him bowed themselves and worshipped. And Hezekiah the king and the officials commanded the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. As they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worshipped. Then Hezekiah said, You have now consecrated yourselves to the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. And the assembly brought sacrifices and thank offerings, and all who were of a willing heart brought burnt offerings. The number of the burnt offerings that the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 lambs. All these were for a burnt offering to the Lord, and the consecrated offerings were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep. But the priests were too few and could not flay all the burnt offerings. So until other priests had consecrated themselves, their brothers, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. For the Levites were more upright in heart than the priests in consecrating themselves. Besides the great number of the burnt offerings, there was the fat of the peace offerings, and there were the drink offerings for the burnt offerings. Thus the service of the house of the Lord was restored, and Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because God had prepared for the people, for the thing came about suddenly. We thank God for the reading Amen. of his word. Let's stand and sing.
here. Oh, the love, the blood, the life of Jesus. And then you may be seated. <clears throat> you may be seated. Amen. We're going to continue in the service as we normally do about this time, and that is with prayer. Praying that we'll have the Lord's intervention and healing power, various things that are needed by us, he, pro he provides. We are limited, he is not. Uh, he is able to deliver us and he is with us always, guiding us, showing us the way, meeting our needs. And I'm grateful for that. And I know you are also. We're, we're blessed beyond what we are able to thank him for. We slow down and try to get it said and just a kind of a moan or a grunt does the job. Thank you, Lord. You might watch yourself this week and see if that's not true. You'll, you'll be broken hearted because he's done so much for you. And he continues to do it, continues to work in our lives. I, um, and I know some of you have thought this way, maybe all of us have by now. You know, we, we don't normally stop and ask the question, what has it been like for you to be a disciple of Jesus in this period of life that he's been your Lord? What has it been like? Has it been easy? Has it been hard? Maybe we don't put that on it. We just get the calling and the love and we take a step and then we take another step and we take another step. But through the years reading various stories of people who spent their lives trusting Jesus and telling the story again and again, it seemed to come up that they were a little more beat up after the last run than they were when they started it. There's a little more um, that looked like just kind of runners in the skin, you know? Something indicating conflict, warfare. Now, we've done a study together in the New Testament account of the armor going on. Those of us who are his witnesses, those of us who are followers, and there, there is conflict. 
for anyone in this world who walks with Jesus and follows him. We are going to have tribulation sometime. And I don't like that idea any better than you do, but it's just, it's pretty clear in the book. It's pretty clear in the account of scripture. And I can tell you after about 73 years or so, when you look back and bring yourself up to where you are, up to snuff, we used to say, well, that's not a good thing to say in church, I guess, up to snuff, not real bad, not real good. But there's been a lot of hits and bangs and things that challenged my thought, changed it after a while about things. And I want to continue to feed on what he provides, the word of God. And let it build our lives. Let it make us who we are. Maybe we could say it this way. Let him make what he's making with us since he's the maker. We never do get to pick up the tool of the maker. He's the maker. We follow him and submit to him. He accomplishes his word and his work. And uh, we are part of that. So thank God for that. But it's, it might be a good thing to do sometime. Just sit down with a bunch of us and let's, let's talk about what it's meant to be a disciple. What has it done? What has it changed? What has it made us? Are we satisfied with him? Or do we still feel like we need more of him? Listen to this text. I'm going to put this before the prayer, before the, the prayer that's coming. I'm in Psalm 119, and I've been in Psalm 119 quite a bit this week. It's a long psalm. But beginning in verse 81, Psalm 119, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Yet I have not forgotten your statutes. Now that's a great statement. I'll come to it just to make a statement or two about it later. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me and do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. You're, they persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have made, almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. I held on to your promise up here, your statutes up here, your precepts down here, all in one bit of scripture. I've not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth, your testimonies, Lord, and I may keep them. One more piece right here in the same area, backing up a page, starting in verse 49, Psalm 119. Remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. The insolent utterly deride me, but I do not turn away from your law. When I think of your rules from old, I take comfort, O Lord. Not hot indignation seizes me because of the wicked who forsake your law. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of, the, of my sojourning. Your statements, statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. I remember your name in the night, O Lord, and keep your law. This blessing has fallen to me that I have kept your precepts. Just a few verses as a little extra piece on what we're looking at in a moment in the scriptures. You know as well as the rest of us in here that Doug came home on Thursday. And uh, at least that's end up with the date I had and... Uh, and his home and they're doing, doing well. The last report, doing well. We're also gonna to begin to pray for Doyle Blevins, Shirley's husband. Most of you maybe will not know Doyle, 
but uh, he's a likable guy I like him but he's got he's got a cancer and it's come on quick so there's a lot going on inside of Shirley and her feeling and th they were they were childhood sweethearts and 60 what years married I can remember and uh, they were together their whole adult life well preceding their teens even right up into the early teen life and we're going to pray for them for him especially so that God will show himself to him he does not claim to be a believer but believers don't have to claim it first they can just become one first and then we get to tell them they're believers finally when they're in and we can see it all everywhere. So we're going to pray for them. And the Lord can take one long life and make it a beautiful thing, even in the after effects of its touch. We're going to do that. We're praying for all of those who mourn in this congregation and all of those who are going through various tests right now. And we're praying that the Lord will show himself mighty. Our beautiful God. Beautiful God. Wonderful Master. We're also praying for Cody. He's going to preach next Sunday. And he's had it ready for a month, so he's ready to go. I know he's working on it all the time. See, the thumb is up. We're ready. Next week, uh, the on the 21st. Cody will be preaching and then Phil will preach on the following uh, Sunday. And that's going to continue uh, what you were working on before. Yeah. Gotcha. Good. Good. And I appreciate these guys not only doing it but wanting to do it. So uh, we'll trust God to bless them. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for the great grace that comes in your presence. I want to thank you for a love that does not let us go. I want to thank you for the sense and the majesty of your person touching ours, changing us, shaping the body of Christ. And I'm so thankful, Lord, that you work in us even when there's not a large group. You're there building, putting together, separating out and making one a people of God. So we're thankful to be a part of what you're doing. Thankful to be able to pray for some of ours today. So, Father, we want to thank you for your faithfulness as you bless these guys who'll be preaching, we just start there and ask you to bless them in preparation. And when we talk about preparation for ministry, we're talking about internal things as well as external things. We're talking about the sense of the working of the Holy Spirit and the clarifying of the gospel truth. And always interior and exterior working together. And I pray you'll bless these men as they prepare and as they preach to us. And I thank you, Lord, that you having having known Doyle's need a long time and had people praying for him before. You know how to make him brand new. You know how to make a new man out of him. A man in Christ. A man redeemed. A man held by the power of the Holy God. And Father, we just thank you for touching him right now as we pray. Just reach out. Do what you do in such a way that we will find it reverberating across our community in the next days, the truth, the result of trusting prayer. And we thank you, Father, for all of your work in that. We give you praise for it. We thank you for your blessing on every family represented here. We ask you to work in the lives of those who are reaching out to you, not able to be here today, but reaching out to you for access to the God who hears our prayers, the God who is our Father, the God who is able to deliver us. May you do your work in and have your way with each one of us. May our families be blessed. May our unsaved loved ones come to know the Lord. May those who do not know how to respond or how to get in a place where they can even know a response to the gospel. 
They need to find it. You need to lead them, and you will lead them, and we may be the voices. We may be the ones who say, come, I want to introduce you to the Master. We thank you for doing these things, and we give you praise for doing it. Bless your people, this congregation, this week. Let us speak your name often. Let us remember that the simplest reaching out to you is heard by you, that we can call on you and you will hear us and work in our lives. Meet needs that we are not yet even aware are there, keeping us holy, set apart unto you. Your will be done, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Our participation in the uh, baby bottle collecting this year amounted to $587.08. <clears throat> That's one of the best ones we've had for sure in a while. And then the information came that last year, 2018, that little program brought in $87,400 between Mother's Day and Father's Day. That's pretty good pretty good giving. It's not, doesn't come out, like most churches, it doesn't come out of a, a tithe box or it doesn't come out of monies given to take care of a building or whatever else we do. Uh, but that, that's, in my, my understanding, in my practice, that is, uh, that is extras for whoever takes them, brings them in for, for PCA, PACN alone. So we're, we're glad to have all that information. It's good that God uh, reminds us of it every year. And if God doesn't, somebody will. You know, he can always send somebody to remind us, but it works. Thank God for every bit of that. Now, I want to get the message started. Hopefully I can get it finished. And maybe without you being in too big a hurry. <clears throat> I named, put the title on it, Somebody will say, I don't know how that applies. Well, that's okay. Just take it home, meditate on it, and see. But the title of it is Home Before Dark. I don't do titles that are catchy very much. Uh, I have been known to run with titles when we did them at certain times early. Run with titles uh, the last minute or two just to make sure. Hey, where's your title? Oh, I don't know. I didn't have one. But we always had something. And this one is, uh, is going to carry its weight along the way and at the end, home before dark. I've told you the story before of the fellow who was looking for the roots of his family, and, uh, and that was in, where was it, Grace Ellen? It was over in the east part of the country in the southern part, Alabama. Started in Alabama and spread out to Tennessee. And he was looking for his family among worshipers. Those who worshiped God, but it just so happened that his family were all uh, handling snakes by then. They were snake handlers in those churches. And they, uh, they're all over that part of the world and they, they used it as an understanding that they had faith to believe I could pick up and dance with a snake or I can drink poison and you remember there's a text about that in Luke near the end. And it's a text that says what believers can do. And some of this is, is listed there. I don't see it as a, a thing you do for a test. It looks to me like you just do it. You just do it when you're in the spirit, maybe. Now, there's my old good Pentecostalism coming in. In the spirit. I wish we had more of that back where we could feel and sense his presence. We knew he was working, and now we get to sit here and enjoy the work of, him, of his doing in us, in our lives. And he got connected with his family and uh, actually got so acquainted with them, he went to church with them. They drove across the mountain, he and his wife went to church with them, identified with the church, and worked his way toward handling snakes once or twice. But when he preached one time, he did the wrong thing. Now, this is, this is the heavy-duty stuff that gets us in trouble even today. It's about what women should do in church. 
I don't know if you've been watching anything at all about that, that big battle going on right now. About Whether Beth Moore can actually say any more teaching in these churches or not, that's where it's at. So then you got to decide who is the woman here and what is she doing? I usually walk away with my head shaking because it always leaves you questioning. This is based on the teaching of Scripture that does not allow women to teach men. How many were familiar with that a long time? Not enough of us. No wonder we get messed up. We don't even know what we believe about that because we haven't gotten involved with it at all. And it's all over the place right now. He got connected. Well, I got these little jump offs. I just, I'll try to get past those and we'll stay put right here. But he, he preached that it was freedom for a woman to, to testify in the church and handle the snake or whatever it is. And the ones who ran that, a couple of guys, immediately said no, right in the middle of the service, stopped him and sent him out and he went home. When the service was over, knew that it was over for him and his family with the, with the snake handlers, that they weren't going to accept him anymore. When he got home, he wasn't quite as sure of himself, of course, as to what had happened and what had been done, but he's driving home from the east. Driving home from the east. Alabama. And he's reminded of something when he was a kid. When they got home from school or whatever they did, they were allowed to go down. There was a kind of a little mountain behind them or hill. And they went down to the water's edge in a lake where he was or the river. I don't remember exactly. And he said, what would happen when I got home, all the kids mostly would just hear their names being yelled from way up the, up, up the water there. All the parents would be yelling at him, come home, it's supper time. You know, he didn't say it exactly like that all the time, I'm sure, but got him home. He said, my dad never did it that way. My dad walked down the slope toward the water, down the, the beach area, and right up to his son and said, son, it's time to come home. It's supper time. And he said he'd lead us all the way back home. And he said, I think that's what's happened to me when it comes to the church. What God wants is me. Not my identity with the snakes or the poison or whatever else. God wanted me. He quit going. Later got into another different kind of church and, and it was much more up to snuff on handling things. And he did that for a few years and now he's worked all over the world doing things. But that was an interesting story to me even then, a few years ago. When I realized that call is what makes us who we are. Do you believe that God has called you to be his? Do you believe that he actually has come to your life and worked to work inside of you and that you know you are not your own? You're bought with a price. You can live to glorify God if you will live to glorify God. I want to share a little bit of this about the bottle and the smoke. It's kind of an illustration for us to see. Psalm 119, verse 83, I read. Runs as follows. And this is not an ESV translation, but it's close to the old King James. For I am become like a bottle in the smoke. Yet do I not forget thy statutes. What is he saying? I've had a hard life. I've had some trouble. I've had some difficulty. It's not been easy. All this has happened. And these words were written using this text in a little encouragement to someone else. Back in the 30s, they used it and reframed it in a little bit in a piece of article I had to read. Now, we'll miss the point if we don't remember that the bottle is a vessel made of skin. It's leather. It's cowhide. They make these containers and they're wineskins, we'd call them. Put wine in a new wineskin. 
and you'll have wine. It's not going to break anything. It's going to sit there and do its work. And when you get ready to drink it, it'll be ready to drink. Wine in a new wineskin. But if you got new wine and you're going to put it in a wrinkled up wineskin, you're going to lose it. It's going to break it as soon as it gets starting to swell like it's going to. The vessel is made of skin, which becomes very, very wrinkled and shriveled when it's exposed to heat and smoke. So the psalmist declares himself furrowed, dried up by sorrow, yet not forgetful of God's word. I wanted to make this a point because, listen, if we're serving God and we're going to follow him no matter where he leads us or whatever he wants us to do, we're going to be willing to do it. We're going to do that over the assured fact that you are turning mighty gray and wrinkled. Gray and wrinkled. Now, we're dealing with that problem in America now, aren't we, ladies and men? It's just about, we're just about as bad as the ladies, or as good as the ladies. They know how to paint. They know how to stop certain things from happening, make it better, you know? And so they're doing all of that now. Just, just want to discourage you for a moment to get to a different place to find encouragement, because this is not going to change after all these years. The product, no matter how good it is, is going to leave something looking like it's got a blemish. What do I do with that? Well, I'll go find another something to get rid of it. And about the time I get rid of it, it's time to go back and get another something to get rid of that which I just got rid of. So it's a difficult deal. But you know what I'm learning? And this is good for me, good for you. God's not looking at the pretty God's not looking at your outside beauty and saying she's beautiful because she's beautiful outside. No, he's seeing the heart. And when God says beautiful, isn't she? He's saying that heart is what it ought to be. It's got Christ, my son, my Lord is in there with her. She's blessed. Regardless, I was sitting getting my hair cut the other day. I should go somewhere where they don't put a big mirror in front of you while they work. Sitting in front of this nice mirror, it's a great, it looks like it makes it larger. I don't know, I'd, I'm not going to ask. I just make up my own plans about that. Sitting in there and she's, uh, she's trying to work some things around and get them straightened up and it was difficult. And I saw she's going to whack too much right here. And she did whack too much, but not too, too much. Does that make sense? She didn't destroy it, she just made it noticeable. Now, some people will be very happy with that. If, you're, if your hair cut or whatever you got going is noticeable, that's what you wanted. That's where you are. Just good. But you can't change what happens to the flesh after applying 50 or 100 years to it. And the sun and the heat all play a part in it. What would we be like if we were as enthused about Jesus and his beauty as we are about us and our wealth or us and our beauty, we just love Jesus more. Just loved him. In the heat of time and trouble, it all gets changed. Eventually, bottles in the smoke look like bottles in the smoke. Wine with all of its markings. Don't you love a little kid? I mean, a little child that's about, well, let's start at six months. That's a good size. And you hold her or him, and he looks you in the face and opens that giant smile. I look for those again when I see them later and find a little kid that recognizes you're a good guy. Not bad. I love those. And when I get to two and three, that is my perfect time. Perfect time. When Daryl and Sherry brought Danielle to the Northwest, we had their visit. We were up there. Danielle was what, two? Two or three, very, very small. She was walking all over the place. We were, we were 
out in a beautiful area with the big trees north of Vancouver. And um, it was just a beautiful day. And it was a tree with a hollow in it, down starting about that high. It had a little V down there where it could go through. So she was, she was into that going through the tree thing pretty good. So we called it Danielle's Tree. That's how she got it named, Danielle's Tree. And she just grabbed me. And I got a picture of her. She grabbed my hand. And we walked away from the camera and had the picture from the back. You've seen it on the bulletins a time or two. So it just turned out really good. And it was a blessing. But you know what? Danielle is still a beautiful young lady. But she ain't no baby. Pardon my English. She's grown up. she got to deal with, with adult things now. And identify with people with her kids. And get the training. She's doing a really good job. But I just, I like to look at that and realize. Because she asked us about some things she sells. And she asked us if we liked them. I didn't know we took them. That's how it is at my house. I, I didn't know we took them. I just take what my wife brings me. So if you, if you find me laying in the street someday, you know who did it. She, she did it. She's going to ask one of you to help her get him there. I know. She's not going to exercise any strength to get me there. She can't lift me. But she'd get you to do it, and that would be all right. Mercy. Have mercy. It's inevitable. And that part of, of what is said right here is, is inevitable when, it, when we talk about it's coming true. And if that, that part of the verse is going to come true, we can see to it that the rest of it also must come true. You got this imagery. The outside, all these markings and this dust and gray. And, and on the inside, you're holding on to his words. On the inside, you're clinging to the word of God. That in spite of how much we look old, we really are getting younger in Christ Jesus. Our trip home is shorter than for most of us, not everybody in here anymore, but it's shorter for many of us adults on the home side than the beginning side. But oh, what a joy to look forward to Jesus coming. Not forgetting your statutes. And if we're going to have to reap the wrinkles, we can also remember the word, don't you think? Take that word to heart. There's another scripture in, in Proverbs 16, 31, and I'm not going to turn there, just give it to you. I'm going to give it to you with the old English head on it. The hoary head is a crown of glory. How many have ever heard the word hoary? H-O-A-R-Y, hoary. That's what it says here in Proverbs 16, 31. The hoary head is a crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. It is a holy head. Hoary head is how we say it on this, on this text. But easy and gray hair is the is a crown of glory, is really what's being said. All you gray hairs, crown of glory. Unexcited, man. It's a crown of glory. Not to be taken away either. The beauty of old men is the gray hair. Gray head. Blessed is the man who meets the inevitables of life with spiritual resources who meets what's happening with the Word of God, always, always looking to hold to it and trust in it and walk by it. Life's heat and smoke has dried him up, but he did not forget the statutes. He had them. This is what God's Word said. Look at me, that's bad. Look at this. This is us. Go at home. Gathered in and broken old man and his wife were being treated to some special recognition for a lot of years of life together. And this prayer meeting in the home was, was more than just that. It was an aged couple who were being honored. They were uh, too feeble now to attend church. It was a precious service with neighbors gathered in and the broken old man and his wife in place of honor. Time had devastated them. 
broken speech, failing eyes, trembling hands, furrowed faces, told a tale of many years. They made a pathetic picture, but it soon changed. We were singing those familiar old lines through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come. His grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. Tears coursed down wrinkled faces, and a smile of confidence displaced the gloom. Time had not devastated them. They had become like bottles in the smoke, wine skins in the smoke. But they had not forgotten their statutes. That is why Jesus bids us lay up treasure in heaven beyond the reach of moth and rust and thief and theft. These work havoc with everything else. We soon become like bottles in the smoke. But it, if we have hid his words in our heart, in the midst of our sorrows, we are reminded of his statutes. May God help us see that inside of us along the way. Let's head toward home. We got to get that done in just a little while. Home before dark. Like the kids getting finally home for supper. What's our destiny? What are we looking for? in the finished product when we get home. We're going to see him face to face. We're going to behold the glory revealed there, added in to this glorious body of the redeemed. We'll be able to look back at our life and hopefully say, thanks, Lord, for the amazing times you were there. By the time when we had a baby coming and the numbers were not good. High. And God so marvelously worked and continues to do so. I know you're like me because there are times in my life when these things build up in someone's life that we love, someone in our family, someone near to us. We pray, we wait, we talk, we do what we can. But our prayer is always, Lord, you are the only one. Come. Put those numbers right. Bring that baby out. Let it be done that way. And he's done it that way. I think sometimes too many people assemble at God's house who don't really believe in his power at all. People who don't have a sense of his majesty or his greatness. Having begun in the spirit, what do we do? Having begun in the spirit, we walk or live in the, in the flesh. That happens all the time in Christian homes, doesn't it? It happens all the time in homes, period. Heard about a boy's school where every morning before classes, the youngsters were supposed to recite the Apostles' Creed. By the way, we will get back to the Creed in a couple weeks. Each one was given a segment of the Creed. Listen, I believe in God the Father Almighty and so on down the line. One morning they were getting along pretty well until all at once there was a dead stop and a profound silence. Then a lad spoke up and said, the boy who believes in the Holy Ghost is not here this morning. <laughs> the boy who believes in the Holy Ghost is not here this morning. Well, should he have been? Man, let me tell you, if you got, a, if you got him reading the creed, that's a very important part of the creed and an acknowledgement of God, the Spirit, almighty in his being and his doing. I'm afraid that's happened in a lot of our churches and prayer meetings and other times too. There's a story I read this week of a pastor who met one of his delinquent members and said, well, 
I haven't seen you in church much lately. He said, no. He said, you know how it's been. The children have been sick, and then it rained, and it rained, and it rained. The pastor said, well, it's always dry at church. Yeah, he said, that's another reason why I haven't been coming. You got a way to get it, don't we? <laughs> dry there, not going to go. Had it. It shouldn't be that way when we realize who we're dealing with. Realize we're dealing with the God who is just so living and alive that is unlimited in dealing with us. Yeah. When we study the beginning and the continuum of Christianity as a not as a religion necessarily, but making it more understandable to us in, in, a, in our way of looking at it in Scripture, divine revelation of, of the God we love, serve, and Christianity. One thing stands out when we, when we study that or look at it. God's ways are not ours. Now, we can say that all the time, but that's the truth. God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And the way he demonstrated his plan and purpose and the way he set it up contradict our sophisticated ways of putting big things together. If we'd been on a committee of arrangements, let's say, you're on the committee to arrange this Christianity and get it arranged right so we can live it out. Think how we could have planned or would have planned the coming of the Son of God. Who would ever have suggested his coming as a baby born in a stable in an obscure corner of the Roman Empire? That didn't make a lot of sense, did it? And some of us would have, we would have had him brought to earth full grown so he could lecture in Rome and Alexandria and Athens. Carry our message. <laughs> oh, it's his message we're carrying. And at 12 in the temple, and the chance he missed to be known as the famous boy preacher, with the whole world to save, why did he spend 30 of those precious years in a carpenter shop, somebody asked. Why didn't he just go? Huh. He said, when he, did, when he did start out, he had some brothers who didn't, didn't support him either, right? His brothers, natural brothers. But they talked to him. They encouraged him to go get out there where people can see you. Isn't that interesting? Go out there and do your thing. Let somebody see you outside of this sitting right here. Just get out in the backwoods. Get up on the boulevards where they can hear of you. You're not handling your publicity very well. He said, I can't do that. That's not going to work. They're going to kill me and that's it. They, they are haters. So you don't want to just jump out there and deal with full-fledged hate. He said, the world can't hate you because you belong to it. Think about it. It hateth because... I testify of it, Jesus said, that his, their works are evil. When that demoniac, you remember him? Crazy Joe? Well, okay, some of you miss Crazy Joe probably, but Crazy Joe. That was a name I gave to this demoniac. When he was healed, wanted to join the evangelistic party, which is exactly what he wanted to do. He wanted to go with Jesus, with that crew. And we look at this thing. Jesus said to him, now you can go home and tell them what God has done for you. That's not normal for him. He often kept people close by rather than sending them out when he wasn't ready and they weren't or the people they were going to maybe. He would have known we don't. No, you go home and tell them what God has done for you, what a chance they had to make this ex-demoniac something special, 
Think what an attraction he would have been. Ex wild man will be here the next morning. People, come on, ex wild man. I saw a wild man from Borneo. You got to remember, he was in a uh, he was in a county fair in a little room eating raw chicken. This is just so you'll have an experience of this in your mind. You may see this someday. You never know. He was just paid help. No, we didn't try his chicken. I was a little kid, but I remember no chicken trying this time. And when Jesus performed a miracle, it was very often that he said, don't tell it to go with, go and tell. Leading us where we needed to be. He performed miracles, but didn't advertise them. We advertise them and then don't perform them. When he chose the 12 disciples, why didn't he start at the top instead of with a band of non-entities reeking with the smell of fish and the taint of tax collecting, no pedigree, and not photogenic? We wouldn't have looked at them a second time. When he arose, why didn't he appear before Pilate and Herod and say, all right, here I am, I'm back. It wasn't time then either. In the following 40 days after resurrection, he didn't call a press conference, didn't buy a TV, try to get it on something. But instead, here's, here's what I love about it. Here's what he did. He said to a weeping woman, Mary, That's it. My favorite connection for Jesus after the resurrection is that Mary and her simple yieldedness to what she knew was true when she saw his face at that church. He broke bread at Emmaus. Broke bread there. And on the side of the Sea of Galilee, he said, I know your Throw your net out on the other side of the boat. And you'll get some fish. What a strange way to start the greatest movement in all history. Isn't it? He's standing over there in the corner, Mary, and she's trying to hold on to his feet now. He's about to serve the two companions who walked with him back to Emmaus on the road to Emmaus back home. And when he got it done, they, he was gone. And they knew that it was Jesus that was with them. And they were thrilled to no end. We try to demonstrate the gospel often the way the world demonstrates everything else. Show you how it works have a hard time making it happen like that. There's never been a culture since the beginning of Christianity in which a Christian could feel at home. We start feeling at home in the culture, not when we're no longer desiring to make a difference in somebody's life, but if we're just looking to live it full in a way that's not very good. There is another statement that I, uh, that we had earlier in the reading. 119.54. Let me read it. Your statutes have been my songs in the house of my sojourning. What's he saying? Some people, lots of things happen that cause people to lose their song. We don't usually measure like that, but I'm thinking about it more and more because I think that there are some folk who just are marked by the reality of what they're playing or writing or doing and it's echoing in their heart this truth about God being right here affirming you with your song, my song, your song. 
I don't know how to make that work. Some of you can. We're pilgrims and strangers and exiles and aliens. We're living in the house of our pilgrimage and we have a song. A song. If there is no song in our heart now, in His presence, we need help. Seriously. I was trying to find this song the other day without the grace was helping me. We couldn't find it. But I got a few of the words and if I can find it, I'll just read them and you'll know what I'm talking about. So that's out of the song book. I know it's probably not worth anything because I tore it out, but it wasn't worth anything before because there's a whole half of it gone. So this should do okay. My heart was distressed neath Jehovah's dread frown and low in the pit where my sins dragged me down. I cried to the Lord from, his, from the deep miry clay who tenderly brought me out to golden day. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He puts a song in my soul today, a song of praise, hallelujah. I know you Assembly of God folks sang that song a lot. We sang it a lot in Decker Prairie in the little church I grew up in. And I liked it. I liked the rhythm of it. It gets you going, make you feel like you're standing in clay that's not hard. It's just about to bubble up in a fresh life. Wow. You know what we see here? We've been lifted out of the miry clay. Our feet have been put on a rock and a song has been put in our mouths. And what is that song? See, we don't know what song it is now. I haven't had a name of a song or a group of songs. Then it says, and this is how you translate it out instead of your statutes or other things. We just say, thy statutes. That's the language they were using. Your statute. Your statutes. Come. Pilgrims, strangers, exiles, aliens, in that house of privilege, we have this song, which is made up of the statutes of God. We have songs that are encompassing God's Word, made by God's Word. You can serve God and sing it. And sing it, and sing it, and sing it. What a strange term, statutes made into songs. Oh, no, no. We've seen that come on a little bit. When they started putting all the psalms, I say all, a lot of the psalms into a, a singable state, they had pretty good songs came out of there. We sang them down through the years. Statutes made into songs. One never associates those two things, but God's law book is also a song book. And His mandates are also His melodies. Words and music, theology and doxology. Wow. Wow. something. Well, you're going to just have to give me one more week when I get back on this one. Is that okay? It's got too much left to throw away. I'll do a little reheating around the edges and straighten it up. Just one more thing. There were lots of times in the history of the church when there wasn't much music. There were not great rhythms and bands and all that stuff way back. When you think of the Wesleyan revival, John Charles Wesley, Christianity was at a low ebb when all that started. You got to go back and look at the history. They needed the music. They needed the truth, the gospel. People came to them by the thousands over that period of time. John Wesley came preaching. It was a dark time when it came to music, but he came preaching and Charles singing. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing great Redeemer's praise. Oh, man, man. 
Couldn't you imagine these guys with their voices and their music and the choir they could have arranged for a while and just say, come and sing this. And the whole side of the hill covered with people praising God and singing a brand new song. Wow, wow. Hear him. This is the one I like for us. We just start, we need to start praying for people to come who are ill, the people who are sick, people who are, are skipping around all the time on poor legs. We could pray for them sometime without taking any credit. Just give it to Jesus. Stand and receive. Hear him, you deaf. His praise, you dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. You blind, behold, your Savior come. And leap, you lame, for joy. Hey, listen. If God wants to use that song as choice, this statute that's going to tell us what he does, then get, hit the beat, get the music, get it going. Let us sing it that way. Sing it, filled with him. D.L. Moody went to Scotland. They'd been having a church fuss over there. You can't believe that, can you? These reformed guys having a church fuss. Here they are. He set the music a tune that was haunting thousands of ears. Churchmen had been arguing over some notes. And Moody came and Sankey came and they brought the music and the statutes became songs and cold theology became warm doxology. What a difference. They found the lost radiance of the Christian faith, the joy of salvation that David lost, the first love that Ephesus left. Without it, it's art. Without heart and light and heat, it's art. The greatest mission field in the world, and I want to stop here, is moving back into position as the ever Sunday morning one. Do you know there are people who visit and come to this church all the time who never yet quite get in because they're not saved? We don't ask them that often. So we need to kind of understand there is a message to share at the beginning. And it's ours to share and give. Art without heart and light without heat. And then one last word, and this is just a word to us who preach, I think. If your sermon has no song, all that the listener will get will be sounds beating on eardrums. Just sounds. Stradivarius in the hands of a master can lift you up out of this world. But in the hands of a backwoods fiddler, all you hear is horsehair scraping on catgut. That's the way to say it, Heather May. Get the heart involved. Yes, sir. May the Lord bless the hearing of his word. Father, I want to thank you now, afresh and anew for your presence in this room with my brothers and sisters. For the beauty of your holiness. For the grace that we have since all this week actually have had to take an eye and point to, toward what was happening and just yield ourselves afresh once again in a hard week. Yes, it was. But you were there and you are here and you are able to heal our sick, to lift up those who are overwhelmed by weakness, to bring life where there is death at work, to give wholeness where there is hardness, no joy, no life. Bless these people, Lord. Help us to respond to you today. And in the days ahead, to walk before you with all of our heart, to see your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want others to join me here in praying for you, you come when the song is being sung, okay? I invite you to come. We'll lay hands on you. We'll talk to you. We'll pray. And uh, any of you who cannot 
and get out of your seat. We'll pray with you there if you want us to. All right? Serious as I can be about that, I want you to open your heart to the Lord Jesus. He's the one who does what we see. He's the one who does what we can't see. He's the one who is who he is. And we love him. All right, let's sing and respond to him. Thank you. 
of you. Let's get our hands together and get ready to go with it. For us this afternoon and this week, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God our Heavenly Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today, this week, and always. Amen.